I tell you, I have thoroughly missed worship. And I know that we watch the videos and stuff, but it's, it, it's just so much different and so much better being here. And I miss fellowship. And I know it's hard for us to, to talk and fellowship and everything the way that uh, we normally do, but it's good just seeing everyone's face and, and being together. And so this Sunday, I'm actually kind of concluding the message series that I've been on called The Exalted Jesus, where we've been looking at the Jesus after the resurrection. We always focus on the Jesus before the resurrection, but the Jesus after the resurrection is revealed to us much differently. And so we've looked at the deified Christ, the glorified Christ, the beautiful Christ, the triumphant Christ, and today we're going to look at the eternal Christ. And so the eternal Christ is the Christ that is going to be revealed to us after the consummation of the kingdom of God, the final kingdom of God. It is the Jesus that we will know, or He is the Jesus that we will know in time without end. And He is both the Jesus that we currently know and a Jesus who is yet to be revealed. And I'll be honest with you, I have struggled to try to find the right analogy for that. You know, I was thinking to myself, well, maybe it's like a beautiful tree, you know, that, that looks, you know, young and healthy and, again, beautiful in its youth, but then it grows into its full maturity. Or maybe it's like an athlete who, over time, comes into his greatness. Or maybe it's like a fixer-upper with good bones, you know, that after Chip and Joanna get a hold of it, now it's revealed in all of its glory. And none of those are adequate. In fact, none of them are even close to, to accurate because the Jesus of eternity future is the Jesus of eternity past. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change. What changes are the circumstances. What changes are our relationship with Him. And the more I thought about it, the best analogy actually comes from Scripture itself. And Scripture doesn't even use it as an analogy. It's a reality. And it's a couple of weeks ago when we talked about the wedding supper of the Lamb and that it's like a marriage. So before Cindy and I got married, I thought I knew her pretty well. We had dated for four years, and we spent a lot of time together and so I thought I knew her, and I loved everything about her. I was smitten. It was intense. I would do anything. I'll tell you. So on her uh, graduation, I bought her a red tandem bicycle, you know, one of the two-seater bicycles, because I knew that was something that she would probably like, and she did. She liked it a lot. And so she decided she was going to go out and buy matching red and white striped Izod shirts. You know, kind of the where's Waldo stripes. And she wants me to ride around town with her on this bicycle in our matching red and white striped shirts. And I'll be honest with you, I was very resistant because we didn't live in a Norman Rockwell kind of town. We live in a lower class, lower middle class, very urban type of environment, a lot of gangs, a lot of drugs. Just think just think of a scene from The Wire and then see Gary and Cindy driving through on their, on their red tandem two-seater bikes with their matching shirts. And the thing is, I did it because I was so in love. I, you know, I couldn't, tell, I couldn't tell her no. Even though it was emasculating and I didn't want to do it, I did it because that's how much I loved her. And again, I thought I knew her so well, and I just couldn't wait to be married because then I was just going to experience all the stuff we were already experiencing, but even more is going to be great. And so then we got married, and I realized that I didn't know the half of it. In fact, <laughs> Heather's really laughing. <laughs> uh, I didn't know that. I didn't know, but just to... The tip of the iceberg. There was so much more to know about her that, that I had never even imagined. And almost all of it is good, and some of it's just kind of humorous. And I'm not, I'm not going to throw her under the bus. But there's like this one thing that she does that everyone in our family now makes fun of that I didn't know until after we got married. And that is that in, in the evening, we'll be sitting there watching TV, 
And she'll just start making these chirping noises like a bird. Like, hmm, hmm, hmm. And we're like, what in the world is going on? And we look over and she's drifting off to sleep, chirping. And I didn't know that she did that. And, and so I learned this about her. But I learned so many other wonderful things about her. She is one of the most creative people that I've ever met. And, you know, she's, she did that whole wing in there, the whole children's wing, all the decoration and all the painting and, and everything about that. And, and I'm thinking, wow, you know, I didn't know how creative she was and when, when she decorates our home or when she makes scrapbooks for the children. Like, her scrapbooks are better than any scrapbook I've seen. They're better than the ones that are the examples that they're trying to sell scrapbooks because she's so good at that. She's an incredibly wonderful mom, and she will do anything for her children. She has an incredible sense of righteousness. She has to do the right thing. And so there's all these things and a million more things that I learned about her that I really had no idea. And fortunately, they were good things. This is similar to our relationship with Jesus. So we have this relationship with Christ now. And we're looking at him and, and, and we say, oh, he's so wonderful. There, there's such peace that, that he brings to my life. There's such acceptance and enlightenment that comes. There's a sense of love that I feel in my relationship with him. Oh, I just can't wait to spend eternity with him because it's going to be just like this the whole time. And we're going to get into eternity and we're going to realize that we don't know the half of it. That it's just the tip of the iceberg. And when that that time comes and we're spending every moment with Him. And the intimacy is a million times more than what it is now. And we're just in His presence continuously. All, all this other stuff. Everything we think we know now is a shadow of what we're going to experience then. And it's going to be absolutely amazing. So the elephant in the room is we think to ourselves, well, you know, a lot of marriages maybe don't, don't work out so well. We marry someone or we get married and then, yeah, that's not the person that I thought I was marrying. And there's all of this negative information. And we think, you know, well, you know, what about something like that? Well, that's not going to happen with Jesus because He is not human and sinful. He is divine and He is perfect. And it is a marriage that is literally made. We use this word literally wrong most of the time. But it is literally made in heaven. And so I want to, to conclude this series again on the eternal Jesus. And I want us to look at Revelation 21 and 22. And if you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to Revelation 21 and 22. And I'm just going to read several different parts of that because it, there's a lot there. And it's just a lot of Scripture, but it's awesome Scripture. And it's so encouraging and so wonderful. Starting in Revelation 21, 1 through 6, one of my favorite passages in all Scripture. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and He will live with them. And they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more mourning or death, or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give uh, to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. We pick it up in, in verse 22. I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. And the nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. And no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. 
The glory and honor of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever into it, in, enter in it, uh, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Chapter 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city." And His servants will serve Him. They will see His face. And His name will be on their foreheads. And there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Unfortunately, we do not have the time here today to break down all of the theology of Revelation 21 and 22. There's a lot there. But we do have time to use these chapters to explore the eternal Jesus, the Jesus that we will know during time without end. And kind of leading into this, there's a few things that we probably should understand about the context. And the first one is this idea of the bridegroom that has uh, been, been being developed through the book of Revelation. And now, especially in chapter 19, where we have a perfect bridegroom who has demonstrated his infinite love, service, and sacrifice through his death on the cross as the Lamb, which is how he is presented in the book of Revelation, as the Lamb. And we need to understand that. Second thing, the language, like the rest of the book of Revelation, in these two chapters is highly figurative. And it is also meant to be a contrast to Babylon in chapters 18 and 19, which represents the old order of things. And the new Jerusalem represents the new order of things and comes down out of heaven beautifully adorned as a bride for her husband. You say, wait a minute. I thought the church was the bride. I thought the church was the one beautifully adorned for her husband. And there's actually no mystery here or there's no issue here in that The church is often presented as a building, as we ought to know here at our church, uh, of living stones. As living stones, you are being built into a spiritual house. And so there's some mystery there where the new Jerusalem and God's people, His church, are kind of wrapped up together. And then finally, the numbers, the figures, the dimensions, the materials, again, are highly figurative and are meant to communicate completion and perfection. And so it's into this context that we now begin to explore the eternal Jesus of Revelation 21 and 22, which is actually an incredible, incredible description. Now, a lot like when we get married. like So when we get married, our entire opinion of our spouse doesn't necessarily change with new information. It's just more complete. And that's what we see here in Revelation 21 and 22. We do know this Jesus, but we know Him partially. So throughout the Scriptures, Jesus is presented as prophet, priest, and king. The eternal Jesus is also, in these chapters, presented as prophet, priest, and king. But it's not in part, or limited in the way that we know now. Each of these functions comes into their full completion. And each of these functions is shown in a way where there is perfection, and it creates the perfection of heaven. So let's start with this idea of Jesus as king, because the progression works better. So in these verses, Jesus is presented as a sovereign and benevolent king who co-rules with the Father. You say, well, how do we know that he co-rules with the Father? Because here and throughout the book of Revelation, we see Jesus on the throne. And the Father is on the throne. In fact, not only is Jesus on the throne, but the Scripture makes a point to say that he is in the center of the throne, which is significant, which means that he is the one who is visibly ruling. Again, 
There's no conflict here with Jesus and the Father being on the throne because Jesus is the physical manifestation of the Trinitarian God. So let's take a look at, at some verses in Revelation that, that talk about this. Then I saw a lamb, Revelation 5, 6, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne. Revelation 7, 17, for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water. Revelation 22, 3, the throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city. Furthermore, we also see Jesus once again presented as God, as the term the Alpha and the Omega is used both for God the Father and for Jesus in the passage. God the Father in Revelation 21, and for Jesus in Revelation 22. And so this is the idea that both Jesus and the Father are the source and end of all things, the beginning and the end, or the source and goal of all things. And you say, now wait a minute. That can't be true. Because this is talking about the Creator God. And so only one can create. And so is it the Son or is it the Father? And again, there's no conflict here if we have a Trinitarian understanding of God. And so Jesus, again, is the visible manifestation of the Trinitarian God. So here, Jesus is presented as God, co-reigning with the Father, that He is God, He is King, and He's going to reign over His kingdom. And so the question now becomes, well, what kind of king is He going to be, and what kind of kingdom is He going to have? And again, He's presented here as a benevolent king, as a loving king, as a righteous king. And we see this by how He treats His people. And primarily through the things that he allows into his kingdom and the things that he excludes from his kingdom. Dr. Henry Morris of the Creation Research Institute uh, writes uh, a description of the kingdom of God. And it is, a, it is a kingdom of life or a description of life. He writes, Finally, we can begin to comprehend in some small measure the Lord's unspeakable gift of eternal life to sinners who had earned the wage of eternal death. Having heard and believed the word of life, we have feasted on the bread of life and drunk deeply of the water of life, ensured that our names are indelibly inscribed in the Lamb's book of life. We no longer walk in darkness, but have the light of life, knowing soon that we shall receive the crown of life and having access forever to the tree of life. And so what we see here in Revelation 21 and 22 is Eden restored. We once again have access to the tree of life. We now have access to the river of life. He will wipe away all of our tears as He ushers us in to this state of perfect joy and perfect peace. And we will know perfect provision and perfect love as we once again dwell in the very presence of God and experience His glory forever in, in His presence. Now, I was just going to move on to now to what's excluded, but... In light of what's been going on here in our country for the last week or two weeks, really, and, and a lot of the, the unrest and everything that's happening, I want to talk about something else that is in the kingdom of God. And I want you to notice uh, that multiple times, and, and, and what I read and in other parts of 21 and 22, it talks about the nations. The nations will enter into it. The nations will walk by His light. And... If, if you read back, we see this all through Revelation, where every tribe, tongue, nation, and people will be represented before the throne of God. So, I've often heard people say, I don't see color. And I don't want to like call people out, but listen, we all see color. Unless you're colorblind or blind or something, you, you, you see color. God sees color, but He does not despise color. God celebrates color. In fact, 
color in the diversity of creation, the diversity of his people is seen as a reason to glorify God. In fact, all of this stuff about the nations is in there to, to, to demonstrate that God is, is so great and so worthy of celebration and majesty and splendor because He has redeemed the nations into the very kingdom of God. And so as God's people, we see color, but we don't despise color. We celebrate color. We, we praise God for that. And... It's not a message on social issues or anything like that. But all that to say that as the people of God, we should reflect the heart of our God. And I'm actually going to address some of the other stuff maybe a little bit later in the message because it, it, it actually works out. But the idea here is that the nations are in the kingdom of God. And that is every ethnos. When it says every tribe tongue, nation, and people, the word that's used there is ethnos, and it's the word for ethnicity, and it is a reason to glorify and praise God. And so these are the things that are in the kingdom. Joy, peace, provision. You know, the nations are into it. All reasons to praise God. But there are some things that are intentionally excluded from the kingdom that reflect on what kind of king Jesus is. There will be no more mourning or pain no more enemies of God that oppose His kingdom. No more temple, which we will get to. No more sun and moon, which we will get to. No more darkness and no more night, which we will get to. Nothing impure or shameful or deceitful or wicked or evil. No more hunger or thirst. No more sickness or death. And so the kingdom of the Lamb is actually a better Eden, because it is a renewed Eden. It is a restored Eden. It is an enlightened Eden. It is an eternal Eden. Why? Because the king now has come into his fullness as the king over all of heaven and earth, which isn't the case right now. And in doing so, he establishes a perfect kingdom where all of the injustices, all of the various aspects of this world that cause pain and suffering, etc., all of those are now taken away where we know perfect peace, provision, etc. And so really the word that, that probably best describes the aspect of the fullness of Jesus as King is the word peace. He brings peace. The kingdom is a kingdom of peace. And so we see Jesus as king. Also, in Revelation 21 and 22, we see Jesus as prophet. And so, in verses 30, 20, uh, 21, 23 to 25, it says, The city does not need sun or moon or to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it its light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut for there will be no night there. Revelation 22, 5, there will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light. Now we have to remember the figurative nature of Revelation 21 and 22. And so we ask ourselves, well, what exactly is John trying to communicate here? And we have to remember that this is not a new image for John. As we read through the writings of John, the, the Gospel of John, you know, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, as we read through the book of Revelation, this is an image that he uses frequently. John 1, 4 and 5, In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. John 1, 9, True light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. John 9, 5, I am the light of the world. And there are many, many other such references in the book of John. And the light in the way that John uses light is the idea of spiritual understanding and enlightenment. 
And that's the way it's being used, for example, uh, here in Revelation 21, 24, when it says the nations will walk by its light. The nations will walk by the light of Christ in spiritual understanding and enlightenment. Perfect spiritual understanding and enlightenment. And the nations, again, are those from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, every ethnos, everyone is going to be perfectly enlightened. 1 John 1, 7 says, walk in the light as he is in the light. And so it's not just enlightenment from a conceptual standpoint or from an intellectual standpoint. It is a light and enlightenment that affects how we walk, how we live, how we treat others. So in heaven then, there will be no more darkness because the Lamb is its light. No one will ever again walk in ignorance of God, of truth, of wisdom, of goodness, and most of all, of righteousness. I don't know about you guys. I just look out at our world and I see things that are going on and I just say to myself, what in the world are these people? Is this person thinking? Or are these people thinking? I watched that horrific video of George Floyd. And I think to myself, what in the world could that person possibly be thinking? The policeman. I see the policeman standing aside doing nothing. I think to myself, what in the world could they possibly be thinking? Going back to the COVID-19 situation, I remember like two or three weeks into social distancing, I was watching the news. They showed a panoramic view of Miami Beach. Man, you couldn't walk through the people. They were thick as flies all over the beach. And I'm thinking, what in the world are these people thinking? I listened to, actually I don't listen to, I know of and have in the past listened to Joel Osteen and his vapid prosperity gospel. And I know that he has a church of 100,000 people. Millions of people follow this guy. And I'm thinking, what in the world could these people possibly be thinking? I listen to atheists who smugly and condescendingly pronounce, well, I don't see any design or intelligence in, in the world. And I look around. And I see design everywhere. In fact, when you begin to study science and study biology and study physics and astronomy and all these things, all you see is design. Folks, in eternity, those of us who are privileged enough to know Christ and have made the decision to follow Him when we're there in His kingdom in eternity future, we're never again, not a single time, going to look at somebody and go, what in the world is that person thinking? Why? Because we are walking by the light of the Lamb. So the enlightenment function is the prophetic function, right? So the prophet is the one who communicates the thoughts and the ideas and the perspectives of God. And so in eternity, Christ fulfills that perfectly. Like now, like I get up here and I do my best to preach and, and I try to preach the Word of God as best as I can, but I'm going to tell you, I'm a man. I'm a heir. Not, hopefully, I hide behind the cross, I hide behind the Scripture, but I'm sure that in the 20 some odd years that I've preached here that I've missed a few things. I get that. I understand that. Those of you who listen, some of you, you read your Bible, you listen to the message, and, and then, you know, you go out and maybe you don't live it the way you're supposed to or you don't get it the way that you're supposed to. That's not going to happen. So Jesus is our prophet. He's the one who you know, reveals God's truth to us. And He's presented that way in Scripture. And that function is working incompletely now because we are a fallen people. We are a sinful people. But when we get to heaven, when we enter into that kingdom... That prophetic function is going to be perfect, and it leads to perfect enlightenment, which by definition and the way it's working here also leads to perfect righteousness. And so we see that from the person of Christ comes a perfect kingdom, which brings perfect peace, 
brings perfect enlightenment, which leads to perfect righteousness. Now, the last one I want to talk about is the idea of priest. He's prophet, priest, and king. Revelation 21, 22, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So the temple or the tabernacle is where we go to meet God, right? That's where, that's where God is said to dwell or where His presence is accessible. And so that's where we go to be in the midst of God. We go to the temple. John 1.14 it says, the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Now, the word dwelling here is interesting. It is the Greek word skinu, which is translated more accurately, tabernacle. So it is the idea that the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us with His people. And this is the same word that is used in Revelation 21.3. Now the dwelling of God, now the tabernacle of God is with men. And He will live with them. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. Now, this word skinu is an interesting word because it not only means tabernacle, when you dig into it, it is also the root of the word glory. Like, the Shekinah glory of the Lord. If you're an old-timey Baptist, you've probably heard some messages on the Shekinah glory, which is that radiant glory of, of, of God, where it just radiates from His being. The kind of glory where we cannot look upon His face and live, right? And so it's saying here that we're going to dwell in, we're going to tabernacle with the Shekinah glory of the Lord for time on end. So, the picture here is this. So, the priest is an intermediary. The temple or the tabernacle is a facilitator for God's people to know God more fully. Right? That's, that's where we want to go and meet God. These are, again, uh, you know, intermediary facilitator to help us know God, to enter into His presence, to experience His glory, His majesty, His splendor, everything, you know, that God is. We want to be in His presence. And so here's the thing. Not necessary anymore. They're obsolete. We don't need that kind of priest anymore. We don't need that kind of temple anymore. They're gone. They're not needed. Why? Because we will now dwell eternity in the very presence of God. You say, well, how does that make Jesus the perfect priest? Well, He is the mediator of a new covenant. And that covenant necess necessitates us now entering in boldly before the throne of grace to dwell in the very throne room of God with God eternally. And so He has accomplished this. It is only through Christ, not because of anything that we have done, not because of any, you know, any special club, we are in, any of that. It is because of Christ. <coughs> and because of His priestly function that enables us to dwell eternity in the presence of God where we no longer need a temple, we no longer need a priest because Jesus Himself is our priest and our prize is His presence. And so we will dwell eternally in bliss before the Father, before the Son, and before the Spirit. What a wonderful thing that is. We talk about or I've been talking about, hopefully we talk about, you know, heaven, the eternal Jesus and all this kind of stuff. And, and I've already communicated, well, we can't know what it's like. You know, I do this premarital counseling with people, right? And, and they come in and, and they say, well, you know, we, we know each other really well and we're so in love, we don't really need premarital counseling. Probably about a third of the people tell me that. But I'm doing it because you make me do it, is what they, they say. And... And again, they think they know. And, and then when they get married, they realize they don't know. And so I've already established that, that we can't know. So just because you heard this sermon doesn't mean you now know what Jesus is going to be like. What you know is that you don't know. And that when you get there, 
It's going to be so much more incredible than what you ever imagined. If someone had tried to describe to me what marriage was like, I would have understood it in my head, but it wouldn't have registered until I really experienced it for myself. And, and that's what heaven is. In, in a sense, it's like those old-timey... I, I don't know if you guys have ever seen images of this, but you know, way back around the turn of the last century... You know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, baseball was the really big thing in America. It was king. You know, everything the NFL is now, baseball was, and even more. It was, in some senses, the only game in town. And baseball was played in a lot of urban centers around a lot of poor. And they would have these fences set up, and there were knot holes in the fences. And the poor children who could never, ever afford to go into a game, it was their whole dream was to be able to go to a baseball game. They would come, and they would watch through the knot holes in the fence. And the problem with the knot hole, I don't know if you've ever tried this, to, to watch an event through a knot hole. You can't see everything. It's not... It, it's not the same as actually being in the stadium and being there and really being a part of it. In a sense, you're on the outside looking in, literally and figuratively. And I think that's what revelation is for us, it is the knot hole in the fence. We see some things and we see what's going on, but we don't get it all. It doesn't click. It's not the same as actually being there. But the one thing we can Fathom. The one thing that we do get is, oh my goodness, it's awesome. And I want to be there. I want to experience this for myself because this is the most amazing thing ever. And, you know, that's what the kids used to say about baseball. You magnify that really by infinity, you know, and, and we have what we're going to experience in heaven. So here's the thing. We talk about the final kingdom being rooted in a person, the person of Jesus. And through His perfect kingness, His perfect kingship, we find perfect peace. Through His perfect enlightenment as prophet, that perfect prophet coming into His completeness, we find uh, perfect righteousness. And then we find by His perfect priesthood and the perfect sense of reconciliation at that point, giving us full access to the throne of God and to the person of God we find perfect love. And so in His presence, through Him, the person of Christ is what heaven hinges on. And it's perfect peace, perfect righteousness, perfect love. Can't explain that. But I know that it's incredible. And so the question is, well, well what does that look like for us? Because I talk about that kingdom being Eden restored. But we lost Eden, right? We blew it. We sinned. And in our sin, that was denied us. We told God, we don't need you. We want to make our own decisions. We want to go our own way. We want to be, in essence, our own God. Well, to make it into the new Eden, the new Jerusalem, we have to reverse that decision. And we reverse that decision, in essence, by saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I'm sinful. I need you. I need your love. I need your grace. And most of all, I need your salvation. I want to follow you. As it said in Revelation, uh, those first few verses there, Revelation 21.3, I will be your God and you will be my people. God, I want to be your people and I want you to be my God. And so if you're here this morning and you've never made that decision or if you're listening uh, through uh, the, the YouTube video online, and you've never made that decision to follow Christ and to make Him your King and to look to Him for your life, to make Him, in essence, your prophet, to look to Him for truth, and to make Him your priest, to look to Him for that forgiveness and full access to the Father. If you've never made a decision to follow Him, I want to encourage you to make that decision now because... Your eternity hinges upon your relationship with this Jesus because everything I just described is found in a person. And if you don't have a relationship with that person, then you will not know that kingdom. And so I want to encourage you to, to make that decision to follow Christ, to repent of your sins, and to ask Him for forgiveness so that you 
will be able to have that eternal relationship with Him. And if you want to know how to do that, and I know we got all the social distancing stuff, we're not going to have an altar call or anything like that, but I really need you to call me. I really need you to text me, email me, grab me, anything, and I will talk. And, and, uh, and honestly, pretty much any of our deacons, Randy, uh, Drew, as he's going out the door, if you want to know how to know Christ, then you know, talk to somebody. We want you to make that decision. Let's pray as we close. Father, God, we're amazed at what is in store for us. And we know that we know a little bit because we know Jesus. And the things that we know are amazing and incredible. But God, we also know that we don't know the half of it. We don't know any of it. We don't know all but maybe the tip of the iceberg. And Father, what an incredible and amazing hope we have to know that we will have an eternity to know You more. And to know more and more and more and more about You as You continuously reveal Yourself to us and Your wonder and Your greatness and Your glory to us. Father, we just look forward to that so much. God, we praise You. We celebrate You. Father, because You are amazing. You are awesome. And so, Father, God, we just pray that God, if there's anyone who doesn't know You, that You would open up their hearts, God. That they, would, that they would embrace You as Savior and Lord. And Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And for His sake, Amen.